Okay, we are now recording, Joe. Cool, that's me. Okay, so I'll do the introduction again for the, um, today's I'm a webinar is really, today's I'm a mainframer um, is, we are mainframers, we've got five panelists here from the zoe.org project, that is a ZOS open source project on the mainframe. So the format, the way today is going to work in Zoom, there's a little chat um, icon, it's sort of down the bottom or the, or the top, depending on what OS you're, click that if you want to and ask a question and we'll get round to those questions and try and have a discussion. Um, once you've been introduced to everybody and there was one other point I was going to make, but I've forgotten what it is. So let's start meeting our panelists. So uh, Jakob, um, why don't you introduce yourself very quickly? What's your role on the Zoe project and how did you get to where you are now? Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Jakub Balhar and at the moment I have two fold role within Zoe. The first role is I'm the current chair for Zoe project. So I'm trying to lead it through the waters to be more successful than it is now. And the other role is the API mediation layer committer, which basically means that I'm part of one of the technical squads and I'm providing the code and running the application that's part of it. And how I got there, well, it's kind of a tough question and it definitely happened at random. I wasn't looking to join the mainframe, but I'm really happy that I did as figuring out how to mend together the old technologies that are still useful and in production and the new approaches and figuring out how to make sure that it works is really interesting challenge and I'm really glad I can take it. And that's all from me. So Lauren, what about you? Hello. I'm Lauren. I'm a front end developer. I'm located in North Carolina in the US. And I've been working with Zoe for a little over two years now. Um, I work primarily on Zoe Explorer, which is a Visual Studio Code extension that lets, um, lets you remotely interact and connect with your uh, mainframe from VS Code using the graphical user interface. So I first got started with mainframes when I joined IBM about three years ago. Um, we were working on a product that kind of does something similar to what Zoe Explorer does. And when we realized there was this overlap in our goals and functionality, it was a really good opportunity for us to collaborate with the open source community and build something, um, you know, become stronger and build something better um, not only for our customers, but just for the larger community as a whole. So Lenny, would you like to go next? Sure, that sounds good. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lenny. Um, I am originally from Belarus, but I came to the US uh, when I was seven. Here at Zoe, I work as a software developer uh, based currently in the Boston area with Rocket Software uh, as part of the Web UI squad. Um, I'm also the Scrum Master for my team. Uh, what we do is we're responsible for uh, building, creating, and maintaining the components like virtual desktop UI, uh, the app framework, CSS. Um, my background is not one of experience with the mainframe, uh, given that I really uh, only began using the mainframe when I onboarded with Rocket. But as a college student, I did take uh, one introductory course to ZOS uh, that that was uh, conducted by Stephen Nelson. Maybe some of the folk on this call might know him. Um, he used to be an, uh, an old mainframer, um, but that allowed me to land my internship with Rocket, and uh, from then on, here I am. Next person. Um, do you want to go to, let's see here, Ashley? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley, and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm part of the Zoe Doc Squad, and also I'm the Zoe Doc Squad lead at the moment. Um, and for the Zoe Doc Squad, our mission is to create and publish technical documentation for the Zoe project. So we have a lot of opportunities to work with different component squads like the web UI squad, the CI squad. 
to create documentation together and provide good user experience to our community. And um, beside that, I'm also part of the Zoe trial program. So um, I created some scenarios for the Zoe beginners together with um, our developers. And this free trial is a good opportunity for um, new programmers or developers who just came to the Zoe world and want to have a try. Um, so how I got started with the Zoe project? Um, well, my mainframe journey actually started four years ago when I got a chance to provide content design support um, for a mainframe project here at IBM. And later one day, um, my manager came to me and said, hey, there's a new project named um, Giza, and that is the old name of Zoe. Um, and it's mainframe and it's open source. Do you want to take the challenge? And at that time, I said yes, and because that sounds really a fascinating combination to me, mainframe together with open source. So I'm very proud that I was involved with the Zoe project when Zoe was first introduced back in um, 2019 in August. Um, and I've had the good fortune to witness growth um, since the beginning. And it's really been a great three years so far working with the Doc Squad and also the whole community to create documentation and see the Zoe content became, becomes better and better. Okay, yeah, that's all about me. So next, Leo, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name is Leonid. Uh, uh, I'm working as a software developer uh, in Broadcom. I was involved with, uh, with the mainframe about two years ago. Uh, the first project I participated in was uh, state monitor for Zoe Brightside. And now I'm, uh, now I'm a part of a team that is working on code for Z. It is a visual code extension pack for mainframe users. Uh, and also I'm involved in the Zoe client uh, SDK for Java project. <clears throat> Initially, another person volunteered to be a mentor on the Zoe client uh, SDK for Java, but uh, he had to be out of four two months uh, just before the start of the mentorship program. Uh, so suddenly someone uh, who can pick this mentorship up was needed and I volunteered. So that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. And just so people can get to know you a little bit more, it's always nice to know what people, what people are very proud of. Um, you know, what will what will be your memory that you will take from working on Zoe? So I'm just going to pick on one of you again. Um, Lauren, what makes what's your sort of what makes you proud working on Zoe? What's your sort of proudest moment on working on Zoe project? For me, um, I would say actually that my proudest part of working on Zoe is something that I've achieved with the rest of the Zoe Explorer squad. Um, and that's the fact that we collaborate and we synergize together really well, despite the fact that we have different backgrounds and we're coming from different companies. So um, the Zoe Explorer squad is mostly composed of developers from Broadcom and IBM. Um, and when we first got started working together, it wasn't always a smooth road. Um, we would have different approaches to um, developing certain features or sometimes just the general direction of Zoe Explorer. Um, and so uh, there was some tension there at the beginning. Um, and we would sometimes have these kind of funny situations where someone from one company would make a pull request doing something one way. And then someone from the other company would make a pull request that does something the opposite way. Um, so it took a lot of discussion and communication with each other. Um, but over time, I think what really helped us was kind of remembering why we're on this project in the first place, which is really just to make a better mainframe development experience for our users, um, mainframe application development experience for our users. Um, and kind of uh, going back to that fundamental um, principle and framing our communication in the way of putting the user first, um, really helped us um, develop a shared vision for the direction that Zoe Explorer should go in and our approaches that we take for developing features. So um, it took a lot of work, but I think I'm really proud of the fact that the Zoe Explorer squad has come together like this. And, um, you know, it's always hard when you have different backgrounds to, to it, it can be difficult to, to have a shared vision for what to do. But I think the Zoe Explorer has grown a lot over the past year or so. And um, 
And now we've got this good synergy going on. So that's something that I'm most proud of. So, um, Lauren, that's wonderful. Brilliant. Thanks for answering it. I love the fact that your personal proud memory is of a group of people collaborating. It, it's it's really it, it's really good. It's 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 not a selfish thing. It's a very we thing. Um, so yeah, kind of applause. Um, would anybody, Ashley? How about how about yourself? What's your what's your sort of proud moment? Does that read? Okay, so um, I can't go with uh, Lauren. Um, and Lauren mentioned that actually a lot of work was made by collaborative effort um, with folks from different companies and cultural backgrounds. It's the same um, with the Dog Squad. Um, what made me feel most proud of the Dog Squad is that over the past years, um, the whole Dog Squad, we do, did one thing right, I think. So we kept listening to the community, to our users, to different personas, to gather feedback, and we took action to improve the Zoe content based on the feedback that we received from various channels, um, just to make Zoe Docs a better place for our new Zoe beginners to get started in their Zoe journey. So um, I think that's one of the things that made me feel proud. proud. We did a lot of work together. For example, um, revamping the Zoe website, um, the Zoe.org community website, and also recently, we just launched the Zoe Doc site UX, which is a new and brand, brand new experience for a lot of users. And also we did a lot of collaborative work, improving a lot of documentation topics just to provide a good content experience. Um, so just a quick story here that I want to share. Um, once we heard from uh, one of our users that defined the current installation, um, some kind of confusing, they do not know um, the clear path of installing the Zoe different components. Um, so our squad discussed and we came up with a good idea of creating an installation roadmap. Um, so for this roadmap, it is just a diagram that will outline all the steps that is required to install the Zoe DOS components. Um, and it is created in a more viral way uh, for good user experience. And after it was published, one day uh, we heard from one developer who is new to Zoe and who was trying to install Zoe. Um, he told us that he found this diagram quite useful and helpful during the installation process. So um, at that moment, I felt really proud that we did something right and people found that it's very useful and our work is very meaningful. So that is what made me feel most proud. That's awesome, yeah. And some of that is highly in the number of uh, website hits, how sticky people are with the site and stuff because um, we do monitor that and it's definitely great. Yeah, so the documentation squad isn't just Zoe documentation, which is, but it's mm -hmm. actually, you're also the public, uh, you know, Googleable influence of Zoe. Awesome. Um, Jakob, how about yourself? Well, I'm most proud of the next major release. Uh, well, the question is why? Because at some point in the process that took last six months, there were moments where I was really, truly really desperate and it felt like there is never going to be any, any more major releases for Zoe. Like seriously, because the needs of the users, of the community, of the vendors, of the extenders, like they are so diverse and we need to figure out how to at least somehow satisfy all these needs. And thanks for the help. Uh, from the people from Node, we figure out some schema that's not just for the next major release, but that gives us a predictability for the future years. And we know now that every two years there will be a major release. We can plan around it. And hopefully no other chair will have to go through this process again. That's so awesome. This is definitely yeah. <laughs> the most difficult thing I've managed within the Zoe. And I'm, I, I hope that it will really simplify the life of the rest of the Zoe for the years to come. Definitely, yeah. And you, you stuck it out there. You you, ha you had to have the sort of patience of a saint, I think, to get through that. Um, how about Leo? What yourself? What's your um, energizer memory or moment for working on Zoe? Uh, actually, I'm rather new in Zoe, uh, <laughs> but I'm proud uh, that was a part of uh, Zoe by, by side, and uh, I'm proud that uh, I'm a part of Code for Z team now. We have a lot of things to do, a lot of extensions and services, uh, but we are doing great. 
so it's a great team and I, I'm proud that I'm part of it. And I hope uh, to be proud uh, of Zoe Client SDK for Java in the future, because uh, we just started and um, it is very exciting. Uh, I, I hope it, uh, this SDK will be helpful for all backend Java developers who wanted to participate in mainframe and Zoe projects. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So what's really interesting for me about the SDK, when Zoe first started, I remember giving presentations about Zoe and things. It was all about the end user experience. The end user was a system programmer, developer. It was all about, you know, the Zoe Explorer, which is great. The command line interface, they both share a lot of logic. But then other people started pitching up saying, well, actually, we're just no developers. We just want to forget your user interface, forget your form factor. We just want to code to the node packages you've built. So then the node SDK was built. And then that clearly has grown out into other languages like Swift, Python, and now Java. Absolutely fantastic. So it's the beginning of a phenomenal journey. How about you, yeah, Lenny? What's, what's your uh, Zoe Patronus? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, um, well, I mean, the, the things said so far are, are awesome. I honestly, I, I feel like even part of this call, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning something new and I'm learning about the panelists. But um, when I first came on, uh, the Zoe app framework was pretty early on in development, uh, you know, not super well optimized. There was a limited array of apps that you could install. But, you know, this certainly isn't the case now. And, and that's really exciting for me. Um, you know, huge community-wide projects that come to mind are, are uh, single sign-on and high availability. You know, like the amount of collaboration that went into those is incredible. Um, so that, that's something that gives me excitement. In terms of personally achieved, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm proud of everything I've done, but I think the coolest kind of first front-end feature that comes to mind is in the early days of the desktop, uh, back when I was an intern. And you used to be able to uh, drag app windows off the screen uh, into oblivion to never be seen again. So I, I created a few math conditionals to lock the apps uh, uh, into the user's screen view. And from that point on, apps stayed on the desktop. So it was like a very cool introduction into Zoe. It was a cool introduction um, into the apps that use ZOS. And um, uh, it was one of those first few interesting things that stuck in my mind. So that's awesome. That's cool. Thanks, Lenny. And I love, by the way, if anybody Googles for the where the, where the Starry Night, Van Gogh Starry Night um, art theft heist mm -hmm. is, <laughs> you've got it on your back wall. That's awesome. Thank you. So one question, I'm just going to throw this out. Anybody can pick it up and bounce the answer between you. So I often like to ask a question. If I could grant you one wish and you can't ask for more wishes, what would be your wish? What, what's broken on Zoe that you would like to fix or hugely accelerate? Or, you know, what, what, what would be your fix Zoe superpower? And, and please, anybody can take the question and throw it around between you. Yeah. I will take it then. I really want Zoe to be as easy to install as your application on the mobile phone. Like it's still taking hours to install Zoe and that's just a mess. Like it's improving. And Ashley really did a great job with the chart that she was talking about. But still, like I really want to click a button and have it installed. So what about you, Ashley? What would you want? Yeah, I fully agree that we could further improve the installation experience. So um, if there's a way to make that possible, I think users will love it. Uh, we are talking about um, the wish. The first thing that came to my mind about something broken or that might be disjointed at the moment, I think um, currently at the moment, it's not easy for users to find all the Zoe plugins or applications. Uh, we know that it, 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 all the plugins or applications they exist in GitHub repos on Zoe doc site or on the Zoe conformance program website. We have a lot of great plugins for Zoe desktop and Zoe CLI as well as Zoe Explorer, but there's currently not a portal where users um, could track all these kind of plugin information. 
Um, so I'm hoping that um, Zoe App Store or Market can be made possible as we move forward. I hope that our users will find what they want to find easily and efficiently. Um, so just, just that a wish. And how about you, Lenny? Yeah, I mean, th those are great, honestly. Um, yeah, I think automation would Im certainly improve a lot of the installation pain points. Um, the, the things that I was thinking about are kind of the things that we'll be working on for Zoe V2. You know, I'm excited to, um, to increase the desktop's performance. I'm excited to increase app performance. You know, um, I'm, I, I'm excited for uh, using some of the latest that Angular has to offer. And, but I'm also excited for uh, the toolkit of internal apps, um, you know, that will be coming out soon. Um, obviously can't speak about those, but um, those are going to be, those are going to add a lot of, uh, you know, functionality and make navigating ZOS easier, as is, you know, one of the main um, uh, goals and objectives of, of Zoe. If I had to fix, like, aspects of the mainframe, um, that's a really large conversation, right? Probably too large for this call. But I think I would, if I could, let's say if I was like omniscient, I would probably reformat some of the legacy that's there, you know, and make things uh, easier to see, um, easier to use, easier to learn. But uh, number one, the mainframe is too large for that, I think. And number two, that's what Zoe is doing. So that's an awesome answer. So Lauren and Leah, just before you do yours, I, I love all your answers, but it's kind of, I remember when I was a child one Christmas and I think my parents gave me, maybe my grandparents, they gave me a jumper, a sweater for Christmas. And I was like, really? You know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna get the sweater anyway, right? Cause I have to stay warm. It's kind of Mavs loves needs about <laughs> staying warm and eating, right? Couldn't I have got something with you know, a remote control helicopter or something, I know, which I never had as a child. So think big. Think, think really big, what would be your, think superpower, what would be the thing you would want to fix on the project? No pressure, uh, by the way, go for it, Leo. I agree with, with the guys that uh, installation is a uh, pain point of Zoe. Uh, there, are, there is no simple way to run, a, for, example, comp for example, a compiled Java application on mainframe, even for testing purpose. So um, I wish uh, Zoe to have a, built-in uh, one-click service uh, that can deploy, for example, a jar file or whatever, a Node.js file uh, to the mainframe and run it, just one click. It looks rather simple, but I, I think there, there are a lot of work around it. So, but it will be really great if, <laughs> if my wish come true. <laughs> Yep. No, that's, that's perfect, Sorry. yeah. Go, Lauren. Uh, for myself, um, on, a, on a big scale, um, I think I had a smaller answer at first, but Joe has told no, me- No, go don't small, don't be pressured by me. Just go <laughs> oh, small no. and then go big, yeah. Okay, well, now I have two answers because you've given me two options now. Two is um, good. So, so on the small scale, I'm thinking about Zoe Explorer. Um, one of the things that we have that most GitHub repositories have is an issues page. And um, you know, this is where people, our users, our community, if they are using Zoe Explorer and they find a bug or they find something they would like to be enhanced, um, they can look to see if somebody has already filed an issue to uh, address this. And if they agree with that issue, they can upvote it. And right now, um, well, this is how Zoe Explorer, by looking at the upvotes and the issues that people file, this is how we in the Zoe Explorer squad um, have a better understanding of what our community wants and needs. Um, so that's very important to us to see what people upvote and what people file as issues. Um, but right now we kind of have to go through all these issues one by one manually to see which issues were upvoted how many times. Um, and as you can imagine, that's not very efficient. So um, if I had a magic wand for Zoe Explorer, I would put in some automation so that we can um, kind of automate the process. And, you know, once 
the issue reaches a certain number of upvotes, it automatically gets prioritized higher. Uh, so when we do our backlog refinements, we can it's more visible to us and we know that, oh, this is something that's important to our community. We should also put it first. Um, so that's the Zoe Explorer level. At a higher level, because Zoe is such a big project, um, something that I would like to see more of um, is like integration between the different squads, um, just because it's hard to do because Zoe is big. It's also very spread across different geographic locations, like across the globe. Like I think on this panel, we have three or four different time zones going on here. Um, so uh, coordinating like the program increment plannings, um, they always have to be set at a certain time. Otherwise it's going to be the middle of night for some people. And I think it's almost the middle of night for Ashley right now, actually. Um, but, and we really appreciate you staying on, um, but, uh, it kind of makes it harder to work out of the silos that sometimes the squads get themselves into. So um, if I could wave my magic wand at the Zoe organization level, I would try and make the integration between different squads, the communication more open between them. Um, Cause it's not just geographic separation, but it's also just like the fact that you're working on different components can sometimes, you know, you get heads down in your work and you forget to talk to the other squads. So. That's something I would like to make easier between everyone. Well, I'm no genie, but I will try to grant you the wish. We really I was gonna appreciate say, your I was, efforts. I, well, while Laura was giving a lot of those answers, I was looking down at you, Jakob. I mean, you, you stepped forward, you made yourself as every TSC chair. So, so I think the buck stops with uh, you. But it's a community. Uh, that, yeah, you're absolutely right to call out the diversity. We are across, we were talking beforehand, we cover 12 hours of time zone, everything from Shanghai and Eastern China seaboard uh, all the way through to May, who's in California right now, which is awesome. Yeah, my, my two answers, just by the way, I was gonna go, my small answer, I wish the fact that data sets had an encoding of what the text file content code page was in, that has annoyed me forever as a developer, period, right? Having to make assumptions about what the encoding is of it. Um, and my big one that I wish, my big wish is uh, I would wish to see it increase uh, customer participation. Um, I know of customers who have huge numbers, tens, hundreds of developers working on, on projects and open source is really about undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, I know, for example, there's a recent project on the open mainframe project called Cobalt Check and Cobalt Check was actually donated by a customer because they were doing something internal that they just thought, this is silly. Why don't we just share it? Um, so I'd love, if there's any customers out there who want to get involved, please do, right? Um, because we're here for you and you're here for us, yeah. Okay, that was awesome. Thanks for those answers. So another one, looking forward to the future. Um, I think we've covered that a little bit. So let's assume there's somebody who wants to get involved in open source, but, but isn't yet, or somebody early professional in their career. What advice do you wish you had known when you were younger? What, what decision do you wish you'd done differently that would have made your journey or your experience with the mainframe a little sooner? Perhaps after a couple of years, you discovered something, oh, I wish I'd done that earlier. Or you thought, look back and think, you know, that was a waste of time. I, I went up that alleyway and it was a dead end and I just spent a lot of time and energy. Who first, Joe? Go for it, Lily. I was going to pick on you anyway. You had that bleep in your way. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty huge question, right? Um, and I, I know for me, I'll keep it a little broad because obviously there's a lot of parts to Zoe. There's a lot of parts to the mainframe. But the, the really helpful but broad advice that I would give is to ask many questions. And this can be applied to many fields, but some mistakes that I've made uh, when I was younger in my career, although I'm still young now in my career, younger, um, is being afraid to ask those questions or being afraid of seeming less knowledgeable, you know, than I am. And you're always going to have that, right, in the mainframe industry. You're always going to have a lot of info that you don't know. You're going to have the small subset of info that you do know, and you're going to try to use that small subset uh, you know, to plug and play those pieces to make sense of what you're doing 
what you're working on and what you're using. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's what I would say. I would say, um, uh, ask questions and save yourself time and save other people time. That's awesome advice. And that plays into, I don't know if anybody wants to, I, I, I'd read about people talking about something called imposter syndrome, which is where they're too frightened to ask questions because they somehow think they're going to invite people are going to say, are oh, you a fraud? You don't know what you're doing. You're not technical and stuff, but. Yeah, and I've been it's... through this stage as well. Okay. And how did you <laughs> overcome that? Well, yeah. well, I guess that what helped is that I started working with NASA and the people out there really valued what I did, the work I did. And somehow at some point I, I just said, okay, I'm probably not as bad the people want to work with me, so I can live with that. But I'm not sure if this is the advice I would give to my younger self. Uh, but I know what advice I would give to my younger self joining Zoe. Mm -hmm. And that would be to, from the beginning, to start reaching out the other squads. Because lots of the errors, mistakes, and things that we are having pain from now happened because we didn't talk to the other squads. Like it took us, since I joined, it took us six months or nine months to actually really start working across the squads for the SSO and how does it work, for the high availability and how does it work. And so we did errors. We didn't have to do them. And as for my younger self, I have, as for programming or software engineering, I have no idea. It's 30 years ago. I guess stay curious, but I stayed and I enjoy it. And mainframe is an interesting environment. So that's all years. for me. Jakob, I didn't yeah. know you start. I didn't know you started coding when you were two years old. You don't. You don't look. <laughs> but when I was three years old, but yeah. <laughs> okay. How about the others of you? Is there anything you'd like advice you'd like to give your younger self, or is there any anybody else any any mistakes? We've had some great answers so far. Or um. Yeah. So if I have I had the chance to talk to my young to the younger self, um, I would say to myself one thing that is to keep learning and don't be afraid. Um, so uh, mainframe is not that a mountain that you cannot top. Um, I want to share one of my personal stories when I first entered the mainframe world. So um, four years ago, I started my first mainframe project. I work with a ZOS product named the System Automation. Um, and be, prior to that, I mainly work on um, middleware products or networking appliances. So um, after I entered the mainframe world, um, I learned that it is a great product, but as a new mainframe at that time, I found that um, I have a lot of skill that I need to learn and a lot of knowledge that gaps that I need to fill. So I need to learn, for example, 3270 terminal at that time, I don't know what it is and it looks scary to me. I don't know how to create help files in it and also the various terminologies that confuse me. Um, at first, um, I do find it look a little bit frustrating and scary, a lot of information to catch up, to learn. Um, but um, later I found that once you put effort into it and you will find that mainframe is such an interesting world. And then um, after one year, Zoe in, came into play um, and I witnessed its growth, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. I saw that familiar experiences, um, especially when we work with the desktop, it's just like the Windows desktop that we are using daily, right? And also the command line interface and even VS Code, which our developers love. And even as a content designer, I can also work with it and also interact with the backend mainframe. Um, so it's just like any other modern technology and I feel so excited. Um, and also as Zoe's slo so so slogan said, open, simple, and familiar. Um, it's the same for Zoe and it's also the same for mainframe as long as you want to learn it. And also just don't be afraid, just keep learning. So that is one thing I just want to share with all non-mainframers who want to enter the mainframe world and want to work on the mainframe technology. No, that's awesome. Lauren, Leo, any, anything or you, you can punt on the question if you want. <laughs> um, uh, I, I actually was thinking, uh, okay. thinking about something that ties into what Ashley was saying and ties into what Lenny was saying about learning. Um, and it's something that I still have to remind myself of today, actually, when I'm doing development um, and I'm learning new technologies. And um, 
it, it's, it's like Ashley was saying, don't be afraid. Like, don't be afraid to try things out and to break them. Um, sometimes, like even today, sometimes I get into this mindset where I think, oh no, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't, you know, because then it will crash, it'll make an error and that's bad. Like errors are bad. <laughs> but um, like as a developer, I realize, you know, that's, uh, you know, having this thought can kind of help, not help, can kind of keep me back from, from making progress on learning that technology. And um, I just have to tell myself, you know, as a developer, you're actually supposed to try things out and break them. Um, it's part of your job really. And, and breaking things is really more of an opportunity to learn more about the thing you're working with and learn its limits, um, learn what it's, uh, how you can use it and opportunities to even improve it. So, um, Sometimes, you know, you can read documentation, which I do a lot when I'm procrastinating on trying things out. Um, I just read more documentation about it, but sometimes you just really have to, you know, put your hands on it and, and try it out. And um, that just gets you hands on learning, which is for me more effective um, and, and gets me to really learn the technology much better. So uh, for me to I tell myself, get over that fear, you know, get over that mental block, just try it out. And, you know, if it breaks, then, then you've found something that the use case wasn't covered. It's an opportunity to improve the thing that you're working with. So, exactly. So the kind of fail fast, fail often. I think I've heard somebody say that before Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, he had 9,000 attempts, which failed. So my dad we, tells you know, me this we, too. <laughs> <laughs> my dad just, told me that too. Yeah, too. What? Oh, sorry. I, I That's guess, ridiculous. No, I think, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know about the number. I feel if his number was the same as yours um, when he told me maybe, this, but maybe. The, yeah. the idea was there, yeah. Yeah, and Olympic athletes have lost more races than we ever entered, right? But they just right. didn't give up, did they? So awesome. Well, this is turning into a kind of motivational piece. How about you, Leo? What would you tell your younger self? What would be your... Uh, uh, maybe uh, the same, don't be afraid uh, to learn new things and technologies. Uh, every experience in a new field is good for you. Uh, don't be afraid to be a, a fool and ask dumb questions or generate uh, silly ideas because nobody knows uh, uh, what, is, what, what will be useful uh, at the end. And uh, what about myself, uh, just involved in, with mainframe? Uh, learn more about mainframe itself so you can help to make mainframe less mainframe than it is now. <laughs> That's good advice. I, I kind of have something I want to add. Is this, is that okay? It, it's Lauren, like a second. It's okay. Go for it. <laughs> um, but something that I really didn't know before I like got into development jobs, like I had this impression that, you know, if you have to, if you get into a big company like IBM or Broadcom, like you have to know a lot, you have to like know a lot of languages and you have to know them well. But when I got in, like once I got into IBM, uh, I realized that it's not more, it's not really so much about the languages that you already know, but like your willingness to learn more and your curiosity, like that's what's really valued in these bigger companies. Um, because they look for like curiosity, innovation, the ability to like pick up new technologies. And um, this isn't really about mainframes, we're <laughs> just talking in general now. But I think for me, um, knowing that earlier on would give me um, a little more confidence when, when I was, you know, trying to find a, a role in development, just because I would think to myself, you know, I don't really know everything about this. And, and it would kind of make me feel shyer, like, you know, not as confident, but um, when, once you realize that like these people who know a lot of stuff, they just look for people who, who, are, who want to learn and who are, you know, self-motivated and driven to, to pick up new things. Um, that's, that's really important for innovating and for, you know, moving technology forward. Yeah, yeah. And okay. nobody uh, knows uh, everything. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nobody knows everything. And sometimes with the mainframe, I think another thing that somebody once told me was that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, right? It's one of those kind mm -hmm. of infinite horizon, um, you know, learning areas. So don't, don't, be, don't be afraid of that, right? There's, that's sort of challenging, yeah. I think every possible permutation of the sort of alphabet is in a three-letter acronym, TSO or, <laughs> you know, four letters, you know, REX, ISTF, SSF, you, 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 you name it. It's, it, we've pretty much exhausted 
um, to them all. So just, put, I've, I've got a few more pre -game questions. Just if anybody is, um, wants to ask a question, then just type it in the chat um, and we can either, you can either come off mute or I can ask it to the, the panelists. So if you want to ask a question, otherwise, I suppose the next thing is, so this is awesome. You laid out a really good vision for what you do on Zoe, what makes you proud of Zoe, mistakes perhaps, not, not mistakes, but advice you would have given people. So let's go forward. Let's imagine you go forward. This is the very sliding doors kind of moment, right? So you go forward and you meet your future self um, in perhaps 12 months time. You can pick any period you want, 12 months, three years, five years, whatever. And you go up to that future self and they're sitting in a, coffee shop or something and and you have that interaction with them and you'll say to them what what would you want to have what would you what what, what do you want to leave behind as your legacy to your future self that you can be most proud of i'm really messing up the question but you can see where i'm going here kind of like cast your telescope to the future what's what's your measure of yeah we nailed it And is that in regards to um, contributions to Zoe or like personal kind of career growth type of things? Let's keep it grounded in Zoe and open mainframe project now, if we could, yeah. Um, but if you yeah, want to make it personal I mean, career, if there's something that you really want to do, like run a marathon or something, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, if I was speaking to myself, I would say um, I'd want to be remembered for my community involvement, you know, for uh, for my demos, for my contributions to reviewing code and for helping people um, and, uh, you know, helping develop the features of the app framework and uh, the apps that we're releasing. Awesome. I'm not sure if that was a good answer. <laughs> it was, a, it was, it's your yeah. answer. It's a great answer. So I was on another webinar just before this one and we had a, quite a bit of chat. It was actually a colleague, Carson Cook. He works on the API mediation there squad. He was doing a presentation on installing Zoe. And we had quite a lot of people saying, oh, I'm looking at the Zoe uh, web desktop. I, you know, we're thinking about using this for all of our mainframe access and That'd be cool, mm -hmm. right? So you're absolutely right. So if your success going forward is that people don't use 3270 emulators to log on, you know, but they use the Zoe desktop and it's plugins to do their DB2 administration or whatever it is. Yeah, you've, I'll come right. and buy That's both mission of you. accomplished. Yeah, I'll buy both of you coffee and pastry in that. But I'll get <laughs> my time, time machine visit you both. Mission accomplished. Anybody else have a sort of future vision for what they would like to see if you go to zoe.org in a year's time? What would go to a Zoe conference in 2023? What would you want to see? What would be the buzz there? What would be the thing that you're proud well, of? I have two answers. One of them is what I would love to be remembered for. And it's like a really great software designs, APIs, extensible software and so on. But honestly, I'm probably going to be remembered by the policies that are written in the Zoe and how we operate and what what what's just who we are. So that's my question, what I want to and what I will be remembered for. And we can't forget the honey badger. Yes, and the animals that I'm bringing to the TSC meetings, like every TSC meeting, you can join the TSC meetings and there is always an animal. Like usually it's an apex predator, like a honey badger, which is great one actually. You really should look on the videos of honey badgers fighting the lions. I'm sorry, yeah. back to the original question. Criti critical part of the charter, agreed. <laughs> yeah, it's a, 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 that's a strange answer from you, Jakob. So you're absolutely right. The engineer inside you, right? The engineer's heart that beats inside you says, I want to be remembered for an absolutely rocking, you know, API that was beautifully formed and was, you know, HATIOS and, and you know, everything, you know, had perfect error codes that were, uh, you know, compliant, you know, every single 400, 500 error code was spot on. But then there's also the kind of, you know, sometimes the, in, in politics, it's the people, you know, the civil service, right? The people who just get stuff done. So I see you have this sort of, um, 
uh, kind of uh, battle yeah. between both of both of them inside you. But they're both wonderful goals, yeah. Um, but but without the the APIs could be written by somebody else, yeah. Right, perhaps younger than you and me. But to do their coordination work, to bring the squad, you heard from everybody else saying we want more unity between squads, right? You can do that, and no one else has stepped up to do that. So just I'd like to say. Um, when I meet you in the time machine in three years' time, it will be what you did for the for the TSC and growing everything. That would be the right. If you start bragging to me about some API you built, I'd be like, anyway. Sorry to derail the panel. Um, anybody else want to say what would they like to be most most remembered for? And I, and I won't pick on anybody else. Sorry for their answer. So uh, also, if um, if I had a time machine, I I think I will say to myself. Um, I, I think I could. I hope I could be remembered by one thing that is, um, I bring more people into the mainframe world from non-framer non -mainframer to mainframer. And also I bring more existing mainframe mainframers to the open source world. So these are the kind of two contributions that I want to be remembered to um, just do outreach to more people and bring them to the mainframe world and the open source world. And the combination of open source and mainframe is actually an interesting world that people should work on. That's just a brilliant answer. And you're bang on. That's the kind of all of the old with all of the new. And to Lenny's mm -hmm. point about the Zoe desktop, people like the fact there's a 3270 emulator in the Zoe desktop. It's they're just switching TV channel, basically, right? But mm -hmm. it brings them into Zoe's world. And then they're going right. to become people who will start to say, well, hey, look, there's a, there's other apps available and stuff like that. Yeah. And to bring the new people on, you do, you do already do a phenomenal job with that. And especially Lauren, I'm going to pick on you next. I mean, the Zoe Explorer, um, how many thousand, 37,000 downloads, I think. Like uh, unique installs, 170,000 downloads, which means that everybody that's downloaded it on average has re-downloaded it three times. So it's very sticky and they're staying with it, right? So that's a very, very good, I was doing some Googling around earlier. That's a very, some, some, downloads in the um, VS Code never achieved that ratio of four to one between unique installs versus repeat downloads. So what would be, what would you like to say to your older self to say, good job, well done? Uh, so in three years time or a year's time, I think I would like to be remembered um, probably most, I'd like to most be remembered for my contributions to making Zoe Explorer's interface more intuitive and appealing for users, um, because that's really key to what Zoe Explorer's goal is, um, which is lowering that barrier of entry to getting started with mainframe application development. Um, just by, you know, one of the things when you get started, kind of what, what Ashley was talking about earlier when she first got started, the green screen, the black screen with green text and just text based is kind of intimidating, even for people who have programming experience in other languages. Um, most other language like TypeScript or Java development environment. And, you know, it's a graphical user interface. So even if you come from those languages and you start using mainframe application development, uh, traditionally, you're stuck with a green screen and it's kind of like, well, in addition to learning the new, or not the new, but in, in addition to learning the enterprise languages, you're also having to learn a new interface and that can just kind of um, be overwhelming and intimidating. So, um, really making that mainframe de application development experience more familiar to people with different backgrounds um, is, is really important to me. Um, so I would like to be remembered for contributing to that and making it easier for people to focus on their development tasks instead of you know, having to worry about getting lost and navigating their data sets or something. Um, yeah, it's... it's that's cool. I mean, it's already it's already started. The the master of the mainframe contest, fifteen year old student learning contest, twenty twenty one is the first year they pivoted away from green screens, and they based right. it on on the Zoe Explorer and a number of plugins. Um, IBM Z Ethernet from IBM and Chafer Z that that Leo mentioned earlier, um, and that's also the Open Mainframe Project COBOL training course. Eight thousand people have done the COBOL training course, so eight thousand people have learned COBOL programming. That's a big number, by the way, to think about using the Zoe Explorer. Um, 
of the Master of the Mainframe, 11 and a half thousand people completed the course out of 25,000 people that registered for it using Zoe Explorer. So you're already there, right? So, so don't walk away, don't leave it. But, but what you talked about making it familiar, Leo, that comes into the point you were making. When you're in VS Code doing other Java development, you can just hit a button called run and debug. It just all happens. And you can't quite do that on the mainframe. So Leo, is that what you wish you could accomplish? Or is that, what, what would be your, you know, you, you nailed it, Leo, in three years time or one year? Uh, well, um, a week ago, uh, I started implementing a Zoe sandbox that will allow uh, every modern developer to build and test their own applications based on Zoe services without actually having access to the mainframe. Uh, and I hope uh, it will help uh, Zoe community to reduce the entry threshold uh, and involve more Stellar developers to the community. So I hope uh, in the I hope future me will finish the Zoe sandbox in MVP and uh, it will be helpful for the community. So I'd like to be remembered as a person who has started this big project. Awesome. So I've got one other ask, I suppose, of all of you, and I don't know if anybody wants to speak to this. So one of the successes of open source, I think, is being social. And I think you mentioned this. Is there anything anybody wants to talk about, like the sort of social media side of Zoe or getting more, how, how to reach out? I mean, Lauren, how are you going to, how, how do you know who your 8,000 users are, right? Or your, who did COBOL or your 37,000 unique installs? You can't scale up and go one-on-one -on -one with all of them or Lenny for the desktop. The desktop gets downloaded. The desktop has been downloaded, I think four, almost four, but somewhere between four and 5,000 times. So that's a lot of people using it. How, how can they influence you and work with you and give feedback? Again, with the doc squad, the doc squad, the zoe.org number of page hits is vast, right? It's, it's some huge, huge number with zeros afterwards. What's what's the best way that they can stay in touch? That, that, that's my that's my point. So we do yeah, have. I guess. Our, oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, um, we do have our Slack channels. We have quite a few different uh, Zoe Slack channels. Um, Zoe Dash Explorer on the Open Mainframe Project uh, Slack workspace is one for Zoe Explorer, mm -hmm. um, but we also have our GitHub issues, um, which we look at regularly during our backlog refinement. Um, and that's really, like I was saying before, is, is what we look at to see what our community cares about. Um, just, you know, if there's a bug there or an enhancement, um, we will look into our GitHub issues to see if somebody has uh, filed something like that. So that's, I would say GitHub issues is the most effective way for Zoe Explorer, mm -hmm. but the Slack channels, are also a good resource for people who are getting started. And they, you know, if you have questions, a lot of the times it's not just the developers, but sometimes other users in the Slack channel um, are, are very helpful. Like it's not just the developers helping the community, but the community itself um, also is very interactive. So um, that's, those are two good places to get started for Zoe Explorer. Yeah, I would just go to the, uh, you know, the Zoe community page on zoe.org. I believe it's zoe.org slash contribute. Um, that's going to have an area where, uh, you know, it'll, it'll have the GitHub for the issues that you talked about. It'll have uh, the Slack channels that are there. And, you know, those can be, uh, you know, divided up by, uh, for users, for onboarding, uh, for developers. Um, and we also have the uh, open mainframe project calendar, right, with all of our um, uh, Zoe meetings. So that's on that website as well. Awesome. I also, uh, I also wanted to add in terms of speaking about Slack channels, um, you know, there's the Zoe Explorer Slack channel, but there's also the COBOL programming course Slack channel. Joe, you will be able to correct the actual correct me on the actual Slack channel name. But there is one for the Open Mainframe Projects COBOL course. And that's actually like a really, really good 
place if you've got questions on getting started because that whole channel is about people who are just learning and getting started. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're just coming up to the top of the hour. So I'm just gonna hand back to May in probably one or two minutes. Is there anything, any closing thing that anybody's thought of during this that they're just like, I need to get this point out or? Well, to everyone out there, help us figure out a way how we can make sure that the startups are enthusiastic about mainframe as their platform. We are not there and we should be. Cool. And if you're thinking about getting started with Zoe, just do it. Just do it. I love that. And the last thing, we welcome more contributions. Absolutely. Contributions don't have to be, you're right, you can take any repository, it's all open source, you can fork it, create issues. To be a contributor, you can just contribute ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, please do, please reach out. Lenny, Leo, anything? Any quick yeah, sound bite? As, as, a, as a scrum master, I would say, because um, we talked a lot about things like uh, learning, you know, start doing things, get, get your hands in it. Um, sometimes that can be difficult, right? Especially, you know, if you have tight deadlines, your team's kind of moving fast paced. So I would say um, to kind of move forward with that and to allow yourself room and environment to learn is try to uh, build that within your own cultures, you know, within your own teams. Uh, try to have things like, you know, innovation weeks, or, you know, if you're following some kind of sprint cadence in your own workflows, try to have, you know, an, a, a hip sprint. Because um, these are the things that will give you uh, time and energy, you know, to get your hands uh, tied up and to get uh, your uh, experience with with Zoe and you'll get a lot of value out of that instead of, you know, cramming for deadlines. That's awesome advice. Leo, anything quickly or else we can just hand it back to May. Um, okay. Otherwise, all of you, thank you so much for giving up your time, uh, staying up late, getting up early. Uh, it's really, I've, I really enjoyed it. And I'm definitely going to start building a time machine and I want to meet you all in, in three years time. <laughs> See if uh, I'm, I'm sure honored, I'm, Joe. No, not <laughs> at all. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, onward and let's, uh, let, let's keep on making the mainframe open, simple and familiar. All right, mate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you thank all. You thank you. Thank you everyone and bye. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye.